how how do you pronounce Selamat Datang? Is that right? Uh, people recognize it, no sweat. Um, all right, yeah, fuck generally it. it doesn't. The Malay language doesn't have intonations. Generally, if you get the syllables all right, you're good. All right, let's go. Okay, I'll do the intro. Selamat Datang, and uh, we're going south of the border down Malaysia Way today with our friend Jeremy Lin from Imagined Malaysia. So Jeremy, welcome, welcome. Thank you very much. It's, good. it's a pleasure to meet both of you and to be on a big fan. Yeah, it's very sweet. Um, and of course, we have Samai Deng on deck. Samai, it's, Hello. So, so what do you it's been a minute. Yeah, I, I, it has been a minute. Every time you say it's been a minute, I feel like it's a personal affront. I think you're trying. You're judging me for for not spending <laughs> you, more of my time. You need sat to spend here. more time with me. Okay. Uh, when, yeah. when you come, when you come to where I am, we can spend more time together. Right? Okay. C- c- come south it. of the Lebanese border, then we can we'll, spend some we'll, time. Exactly. <laughs> we'll cuddle. We'll cuddle. All right. Um, Malaysia, let's go. Me and Samai are pretty much in the dark here, yeah. so I, I don't even know where to I, start. I, I, owned, <laughs> I owned one book about the, 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 the two emergencies and the insurgency, and I just lost it, so I, that's all. I have nothing now. <laughs> it, it's, um, it all comes down to you to educate us. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll do my best. Um, I will say that uh, I have done an exhibition on the Malayan emergency, um, but... I will admit I haven't done too much reading. I have a book on my shelf called The Origins of Malayan Communism. I've been meaning to read it for years. Um, It goes into the uh, origins of, you know, communism in Malaysia, starting with the anarcho-communists who arrived um, and all the way up to, you know, the death of the insurgency, probably in the... Officially dead in the 90s, but basically they were powerless to fight back in the 70s. You might know that the famous leader of the insurgency, Chin Peng, was in Thailand in exile. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't know how well reported that was in Thai local news. Um, uh, not very. Um, maybe we should, um, I don't know, start off a little bit further back and do like yeah. a little brief overview because there's a lot There's a lot we want to cover on our little our kind of jaunts into other ASEAN countries like this one. Nice. So um, one thing which I think is good to establish was it would be like pre-colonial Malaysia, pre-British colonial Malaysia. So there, there was it, there were all these different states, right? Can, can you explain the different states? All right. So there were I think three categories of states uh, on the peninsula um, that's separate from East Malaysia, which has the state of Sabah and Sarawak. Um, I won't go into too much detail on the history of that. Um, but generally, there were the Federated Malay States, the Unfederated Malay States, and I think it was the Strait Settlements. So the Strait Settlements were um, some of the bigger hubs, like uh, I think it was Penang, Malacca, and Singapore. So these were the Strait Settlements, right. uh, generally trading trading hubs. The rest of them um, were, I think most of the tin mining operations were concentrated in the federated Malay states right. and the unfederated Malay states, you know, generally was uh, plantations or subsistence farming and so on. Um, so that's that's just the general layout. Just so we can get like a grab onto something to hold onto for us Thai people to understand. <laughs> Patani is separate from this entirely. That doesn't fall into either any of those three categories, right? Yes, it doesn't. Um, and I and I must say I'm not that familiar with the whole Patani subject. I, I know there was some contestation over um, the territory uh, with some of the kingdoms to the north prior to uh, British colonization. I think after the fact they kind of just left the border alone. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, there's some collaboration with the... I mean, the Thais have a agreement with the Americans and then they broached that with the British. But um, the contact that I actually passed to you might be able to elaborate on that yeah. much better. Um, we're we're going to try and do another Patani episode in the future. Nice. Um, so, so the British kind of... So the British kind of come into this... It's it, it, the, these states. They did kind of. There was a, they were fighting a little bit amongst themselves. I I would imagine. I yeah. also I understand right. And and the British kind of came in and there was, and came in and kind of. I don't know how gradual was the takeover. You know, or how how did that kind of work? 
it happened over the process of I would say hundreds of years. I mean, if you think about, honestly, I'm forgetting my, I'm forgetting my, um, you know, high school textbook. I mean, high school history <laughs> syllabus. Um, they have all the dates and shit because, you know, um, I think the. Portuguese ruled Malacca, and then it went over to the Dutch, mm. and then it landed up in British hands. Um, and the rest of it, I think, from then on out, you know, was 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 generally British conquest um, of all the different states. There was wrangling here and there. Um, there were some deals made. I think what's more, what's more regularly sort of repeated in the public sphere is the idea that you know, the the sultans here just signed away the countries. I mean these these individual kingdoms um, through through dealings and over time because of the deals that they signed and the superiority of British firepower, um, you know eventually the British came to basically take over these states through what were called advisory roles. So there weren't too many skirmishes. Of course, there were rebellions and uprisings, but generally in terms of the takeover process, it was. Largely non-violent. <laughs> non-violent doesn't necessarily mean non-coercive, so that's a, correct. That's an important thing for everyone to, to to keep in mind that no matter how it happens, imperialism and colonialism are very coercive, and you know, depending upon how you define violence, um, in 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 the non-physical way, violent uh, processes, and um, how how would you say? Uh, we're sort of jumping a little bit ahead, maybe, because we're missing a little bit of colonial history. But what would you say is the the biggest like colonial legacy that uh, the Malaysia sort of still carries on post um, independence? I think there's this concept of a dual economy. So in the in the colonial era, there was you know um, the very capital intensive um, kind of resource extraction economy. So tin mining. Mm, mm, um, mm. Rubber, I don't think they got into palm oil. Uh, that could have been a bit, a bit later into the a, a bit, in, a bit later and into the early twentieth century. But generally, it were these two commodities, tin and rubber. Um, and on the flip side was the subsistence economy. You know, this is a great jumping off point because you know you're asking about the colonial economy. Um, like I mentioned, there's this dual economy, and race plays a really big role in in terms of the framing of all of a lot of this discussion. Um, because even before the British arrived, uh, migrant Chinese labor was brought from the mainland uh, over to Malaysia to mine the tin. Uh, we have stories. I think the founder of Kuala Lumpur is some Chinese dude. Um, and, you know, there were, there were a lot of these, I don't think the secret societies emerged later, but there were kinship ties that allowed for a lot of this migrant labor to show up. So by the time the British arrived, you know the the flow the flow of labor from China was continuous. Uh, I don't have the details of the flow back, but there were some. Go ahead, Gabriel. Can I ask? Um, in Thailand, we there was a very similar thing. You had this kind of uh, uh, they call it coolie labor, right, mm -hmm. coming into Thailand, and at that time they kind of formed the budding bourgeoisie because they weren't the 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 native, I suppose you could say, Thai people were bound to the land typically um, yeah. whereas uh, Chinese uh, people coming in were free to supposedly you know there's still coercion under capitalism but were free mm -hmm. to enter into capitalism right was that a similar situation uh, it was for that small layer of merchants but okay a large group of migrants were brought here um, and this I don't have the exact figure but I would guess between 80 to 90 percent of the Chinese who currently live in Malaysia uh, are probably from this class. Um, I will get into the Chinese capitalist class later on, but um, it, it's similar to Thailand. Uh, they did have a uh, merchant class here, and our history textbook tells us uh, the I Indian labor also had a similar merchant class. Um, I think they were called the Chitia. Um, so this was of different... Um, for India, I think it was of different... What's the word for their subgroups? I'm trying to remember. Oh, yeah. Castes. Yeah, different castes. Yeah, so upper, yeah. higher castes, um, Indians who came here were of the merchant class. The low, the lower caste were uh, brought in as uh, laborers for the plantations. And so Chinese were generally involved in tin mining, concentrated in the urban areas, 
a small group of merch, small group of them were merchants. Um, the Indians came later because that was obviously because of British control of uh, you know colonial India that they were able to bring in um, an immigrant population. They brought in not just the people to um, to work in the plantations, but they also brought certain caste groups to be supervisors. And so you know you can you you can speak to Indians here generally who are English educated. Chances are they would may have, they may have come from this supervisory class of you know slightly upper caste groups. The, um, this sort of the um, different races being in different management position, uh, one in a management position, one in a sort of a, a labor position. Is what was the reason behind that? Because it reminds me of like when the Romans came to Britain and they they put people from like North Africa in charge of the, the garrison so they weren't they would feel more um, they, they wouldn't feel as related or they wouldn't feel empathy towards the um, the the Britons or something like that is, is there any yeah. is there any relevance I was just gonna say that's also sounds similar to when uh, I think it was Chula Longkorn had uh, samurai guards right? <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> yeah okay yeah. so what was what was behind the, the uh, that, that kind of dynamic for the Indian case, yeah, I don't know. I've never really asked that. I think it was a deliberate strategy because I think these they, they it was more it was more familiar. They were probably you know they probably knew the language to some extent. Um, but you know, I won't authoritatively say I know. I was once talking to in Kuala Lumpur talking to a he's a professor. He's half Tamil and half uh, another group. I don't remember and. Okay. I think if I remember, he was saying like most of the Tamils were the 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 workers, right? The laborers, and that's how Brickfields in in Kuala Lumpur got its name. You know, it's like it was where they made bricks, right? right? Which now today is like the Indian neighborhood. Um, anyway, he was saying like you know on his I guess mum's side they were Tamil, they were workers, whatever, um, like almost slaves, as he said it. And uh, the other side was from i think northern india or something like that and they were like the administrators or something like that yeah that that that, so. that captures it quite well um yeah. colleagues have i mean friend friends of mine have done better homework in terms of uh the indentured servitude uh systems that were set mm. up uh in terms of bringing migrant labor in from india i can't speak for the chinese ones because the chinese ones you know personally i myself am fifth generation so that that's quite far removed mm. um and so you know, in terms of in terms of new flows of immigrant labor, that that kind of slowed down. Sorry, can I ask um, just to get a sense of like how how long these ethnic identities remain in place? Like your fifth generation, do do you speak any Chinese languages? I I went to a Chinese school. Uh, that wasn't so much because so, of my yeah. parents. Yeah, and uh, my parents didn't bother to teach me the dialect because you know English was clearly the superior language when it came to you right. know advancing your career or getting around in Malaysia so but you can speak some I can speak Mandarin uh, but that's okay. not by virtue of my parents my parents went to mission school so they right. spoke English and whatever dialect they spoke at home um, yeah but it's pretty rare for like ethnic Malays to speak Mandarin right this is a bit of a segue but what's funny right now is that okay. the quality <laughs> yeah. of um, Mandarin I mean Chinese medium schools the quality of education there is much higher and so you know, Malay families recognize this and are willing to put up with the fact that Mandarin is such a hard language to learn. They're willing to send their kids to these Mandarin schools to get ahead. So I had, right. I had two or three um, Malay uh, classmates and two of them were not of mixed family. They were purely Malay and they decided they needed their kid right. to go into this system to get ahead. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's so, it's so complicated that ethnic mix up today but i guess like you say we're getting ahead of ourselves we so we could go back to the colonial <laughs> era just to, you know put yeah. that under the microscope a little bit more yeah I, I will apologize that this might not be satisfactory to people who are interested in the more sort of cultural aspects because i'm uh, i've read books on capital capitalism and a lot of industrialization yeah and so the chinese population when they were brought here to do tin were increasingly displaced from the tin industry because when the British came in and took over, they brought in more capital-intensive sort of tech. You know, they brought in dredging machines. They didn't need to, you know, bend over and use the pan and try and get the tin out of the ground. They had machinery to do that. So there was an increasing displacement. Um, 
as the 1850s rolled up all the way up to like probably the pre-World War II, you know, tin was a huge industry for the uh, the UK, and you can you 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 might be able to imagine why they they were canning a lot of things. So tin was an essential component of the canning industry. Um, the other side of it was rubber, and rubber w- was primarily pursued by the the Indian Indian migrant labor. Um, and so they would they would be making these deals with the royalty and the feudal class to be able to acquire land because much of this land, if they if it wasn't forested, belonged to the Malay peasantry. And a lot of popular history suggests that you know um, the Malays were not suitable for this. Well, not they were not suitable. They were not. They could not be pushed or were not willing to partake in this really exploitative process of tin mining or working in a plantation. And so the British strategy was to have indentured migrants work these industries and leave the Malay peasantry largely alone. And so they ended up just sticking to the subsistence sector. Of course, their feudal class uh, became British administrators. And, and obviously the royalty just does what the royalty does. It you know probably just collects tribute or whatever. So that that became the that's largely the class layout of the three major races in Malaysia, right? They all have an elite class. They all have what look like a supervisory or capitalist class, and then you know there's what we could consider like the proletariat or the peasantry overall. Um, and some of that was was British constructed. There was, was there a- much? Sorry, was there much antagonisms between those different? But either between classes and b- between ethnic groups as well, or was there any inter-ethnic class solidarity during colonial era? Good question. During the colonial era, uh, it was tough to talk about inter-ethnic class solidarity because uh, the working class um, were largely Chinese. Um, the peasant, I mean, the peasantry was Indian and Malay, and they were split. And I think col- uh, I was reading a article from a colleague of mine like um, you know there were instances where M- Malays you know were paid to be strike breakers so that and so this was this was very much but and this was very much by design that you know it was split into these different sectors Indians for plantations uh, you know agriculture for Malays and whatever manufacturing that there was in the city was largely confined to the Chinese population um, we were trying to dig up histories of uh, inter-ethnic so- so solidarity. And I guess there were moments of that, um, particularly on the left, but it was heavily Chinese dominated. So it was tough to really speak of it as a mass kind of event. Yeah. Um, so then World War II comes along and of course Japan takes over the whole peninsula. Um, was there much resistance to Japanese rule like there were in some other places or like uh, Burma, for example, or not so much? There was resistance to Japanese rule. Uh, that that gets into a bit about the left um, because yeah, the there CMCPM. were communists. Correct. There were uh, communist regiments who, who, who fought alongside the British and that and Same the Japanese Burma. occupation really inflamed inter-ethnic tensions in a way that you might Maybe you don't see that in Thailand, but I guess this is this is more this is a bit more similar to the Yugoslavian sort of situation where the Croats mm. were collaborationists. So here in yeah. Malaysia, you know, the Malay feudal class decided to to play along, um, to to collaborate with the Japanese, right. and the the Chinese because of um, Japanese sort of anti-Chinese kind of sentiment that was hold over. Mm. They were particularly harsh to the Chinese here. I'm sure the Chinese here weren't happy that, you know, the Japanese decided to go and, you know, beat up mainland China also. So there was already a built-in antagonism that, you know, already, you know, would have this be a really bad start. So I also read something about how incredibly brutal the Japanese were to Tamil workers as well. That I have not, that I don't have too many stories about. Um, Oh, there's a really really horrific wikipedia page you can read about that so, okay yeah uh, i don't well, know I don't, if it's you know whatever i don't know if I, I should say i should but you know i think for being malaysian i probably should read up a bit about that um but in terms of the brutality um most of it got got carried down by anecdotes from um you know people's like 
grandparents or great grandparents about mm. you know the kind of um, kind of like random acts of terror the Japanese decided to inflict on uh, the you know urban dwelling Chinese population. So that's mm. that's the that to me is the extent of it because I think the 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 textbook isn't crazy about telling you all the gory details like on that Wikipedia page, right. you know. So it kind of glosses over it. So you're not having to ask your friends. And so all was the 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 communist movement that was uh, fighting against Japanese was that predominantly Chinese? It was. Um, yeah. There were instructions from, I believe these were instructions from the Comintern or the or the or the Communist Party that was looking over the the CPM here. I believe it might have been the Communist Party of Vietnam. Told you know mm. reprimanded the the communist uh, leadership here for not figuring out how to sp- reach out to other races. You know, it was predominantly Chinese. Right. There were some Malays in the leadership, um, but that was really small, like one or two kind of thing. So it, it became largely a sort of um, racial issue. And you can see that play out in the news today, you know, where the parliamentarians will, you know, just use communists like a slur to sort of bad mouth or just curse at, Chinese politicians in Parliament. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's it's similar to um, the the Communist Party of Thailand was predominantly just Chinese um, in in the beginning, uh, and that's why a lot of the 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 analysis was adopted directly from the the, the Communist Party of China. So a lot of it was um, uh, um, sort of the Mao, Mao Zedong thought. Uh, and secondly, my favorite part about uh, the communists in the Second World War in, in Malaysia is that, yeah, after they fought alongside the British, they were given medals and then immediately, three years later, decided to embark upon an <laughs> insurgency. Uh, yeah. uh, and and it, it just, it, it just I don't know, it just makes me laugh. Um, and that rose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it was yeah. probably some of their guns. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And their tactics and their everything. They know. They they knew because ev- they would have been told how to you know do the, the uh, yeah. So it was. Well, this story is re- is not a unique exactly. one, frankly. Exactly. Like in Vietnam as well. Just think about Ho Chi Minh mm. and fighting against the Japanese and. Mm. Yeah. Mm. There's there's the Southeast Asian solidarity. The the, the oh, Southeast yeah. Asian shared history. The, the, yeah. <laughs> and and Seritai as yeah, well. Seritai, Seritai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. vaguely turned into the insurgency. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, we're running around. Yeah. So, so <laughs> we, can we like uh, get on the road to independence then? Yeah. Um, you know, independence kicks off. Um, the Malaysian economy is still incredibly tied to the British economy. And that was by that was really by design, you know. Um, mm. they had crushed uh, by the time of independence was fifty seven. Uh, 48 was a declaration of the emergency where they just went around trying to eliminate the communists as fast as they could so that, you know, in preparation for um, this independent Malaya that would serve colonial interests. Um, So when you said they were trying to eliminate the communists, what what was that? Was that like the massacres that happened in the other moments of of the insurgency or was that something else? It was those moments uh, and... Coupled yeah. with that, the crushing of trade unions, um, you know, because the anti- right. the communist threat was, you know, a very convenient excuse to crush trade unions across the board. But they were not completely defeated. Um, they would be mm. defeated a little bit further down the road. So, you know. But that's interesting seeing that te- technique of, you know, we know independence is coming. Let's mm. make sure that this doesn't fall into like leftist hands yeah. and we'll eliminate as many leftists as we can before independence. It's an independent uh, again, state that serves our needs. Exactly. So yeah, it's, it, it, it's you know, I, even there are people on the left who are like, oh, you know, we do live in a post-colonial world, and it's like, well, oh, hmm, <laughs> kind of, you know, I I really don't buy that. Yeah. Well, there's an interesting see how twist these that will come a bit later. Yeah. Um, and okay. it's questionable whether it does serve their interests anymore. Um, but you know, I'll, I'm getting ahead of myself. So. Independence kicks yeah. off. Sorry, Sorry, before we get onto that, I feel like we've kind of skipped over the communist insurgency. I mean, and actually, Samai, I know you know quite a bit. You're you're a bit of a counterinsurgency head. I like counterinsurgencies, <laughs> not because I like countering insurgencies, but because I like to learn about how to counter insurgencies and then counter counterinsurgencies. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> well, no, I, I was just thinking about how, like, um, uh, uh, as as far as I understand, um, 
sort of the way the British operated sort of created like the concept of search and destroy and, and, and the way in which um, in counterinsurgencies in sort of Southeast Asian nations would be take would be carried out. Um, so uh, one question I would probably ask actually is sort of how was the um, how was like the, the local I guess Malay ruling class sort of involved in the counterinsurgency efforts because I know that if in the case of the CPT because it was um, the Americans helping the, the, the Thai state um, the Americans were all about the bloodshed and brutality thing and the, not saying the Thais weren't but then the Thais were also like well let's also try and approach this from a political point of view let's let's try and pull away the CPT's platform if they want development and urbanization we will do the development and urbanization what, what, what sort of what sort of happened um, in, in that kind of sense if anything happened uh, in, in Malaysia at the elite level, I can't say that there was too much. So obviously, you know, because this was um, this was a largely ethnic Chinese um, communist insurgency, uh, the Chinese elite, you know, tried to be like, uh, let's remain united for, you know, a prosperous Malaysia, this kind of like banners and all that. So they did, they do their best, but the elites didn't have to intervene too much because um, it's suddenly all coming back to me now. Um, they developed this sort of tactic to isolate um, you know uh, both the Malay peasantry the you know the Chinese the small the small Chinese peasantry um, because there were some who you know engaged in uh, you know the rubber the rubber industry and the indigenous people so they established um, and they also tried to they also tried to sort of um, centralize or sort of consolidate uh, some of these Chinese populations. So, you know, around Malaysia, you will see these things called new villages. So new villages were basically, you know, military encampments. So they would, you know, bring people there, watch them, um, and, you know, make sure that they didn't provide the communist insurgency resources. Right. That that sounds exactly the same as the, um, I forget what it was called, the strategy in Vietnam. It was like the Hamlet strategy or something like that. So they basically uh, had like, that full overwatch of a village and they permitted times yeah, that people I, could I, go I, out into the paddies and farm. Program. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Like, uh, basically controlling, is is basically turning a village into a prison camp, yeah, essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah just, and, they, and they'd watch, they'd watch who went, who goes out in the night time to go join, who puts on the, who puts on their black pajamas and joins the Vietnamese, is how the song yeah, goes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I gather that like these strategies were really developed by the British. These counterinsurgency strategies were developed developed by the British in Malaysia at this time, right? Yeah, there were guardians. Art, there were I forgot it was was it a Guardian article, but basically there were I think there were Americans who came to to the UK to learn about the this mm. counterinsurgency tactics, and I think mm. there's there's been unearthing of documents that they used chemical weapons here also before they were ever deployed in Vietnam um, and I'm trying to remember if it's exactly Agent Orange but I don't think so I think it was a different kind of chemical that was used um, but, a prototype you know, yeah. it was brutal uh, uh, agreed people can go and look up the photos I guess I was I was just saying to Jeremy off mic like um, something that really pissed me off was like David Cameron the former oh. British Prime Minister went to Malaysia yeah and did a kind of finger wag and saying like, no, you bad Malays going and joining ISIS and chopping off heads, you know? And it's like, in your fucking lifetime, mate, that's exactly what the British were doing in Malaysia yeah. in the jungle. <laughs> so yeah, fuck them. Um, yeah. He, he probably didn't read that part of British history. And <laughs> like it or not, the, the Malaysian textbook is invested in erasing part of that history also because it ends up being very mm. pro-British it, it talks a lot about it, it talks about the Malay heroes that we should we should look up to because they let they let uprisings and all that you know fortunately mm. enough for the, these Malay nationalists they're all Malay um, yeah. so you end up with a picture that the British really didn't do any harm here so that's what most Malaysians believe about the British and so there isn't this kind of anti-colonial sentiment that's built up in uh, in people from the school system 
you end up learning it from the outside of you know reading articles of Wikipedia. So that that's an that that would be one of the colonial legacies that I would point to as pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that's that's the case across the formerly British the the former British colonies that I've been to. Like I, I've speak, spoken to people about like the you know the what what the British Empire did in these places as a fucking Brit with my accent and what have you and they and they're just they're too chill. I'm like, no man, come on, be annoyed. You know, I'm why am I angrier than you? <laughs> yeah, they say that. <laughs> It was um, seriously like like in Burma and Malaysia, like pretty much, yeah, everywhere. I hope it's a little better in India because you know I sure they were more brutal. In Maybe, oh, right? absolute, dude, absolutely. Yeah. Abs- four and a half yeah. years and I never stopped getting shit. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, oh yeah, you used to live in India. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Wait, did you actually ever get shit? No, 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 no. I never got shit. Because look at me. <laughs> never. Well, I guess. You, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I spoke with an American accent the whole time I was in India. Ah, yeah. okay. Um. Independence kicks yeah. off. Uh, all all the sectors that I've described largely remain the same. You know, there was no large economic shift in one direction or another. And I'm so, sorry to interrupt you so soon, but is the what is the big driver for independence? Is it Malay nationalism or is it an inter-ethnic? kind of nationalism so it was an elite compromise uh, all the major parties of the okay. alliance that that pushed for independence were generally represented by these capitalist or feudal classes uh, they got all the elites on board the elites were able to form what nominally seemed like mass parties and were able to win uh, an outright victory in the elections i think they won 51 out of the 52 seats this is again from the history so textbook just exactly as the brits wanted right <laughs> yeah so i don't know I actually haven't done the reading on like how big the franchise was, but the history textbook says it's representative. I have a hard time believing that, mm. but you know, they could have done all sorts of things to suppress the vote or just not tell anybody about it. Um, yeah. But this is largely the history that, that we've inherited. And so post-independence, um, with the economy basically the same, a lot of, a lot of people were in you know, poverty or immiseration. Um, subsistence farming was not going to go anywhere because I think I read a book where you know, as subsequent generations continue to proceed, there's less and less land because all of it is being swallowed up by plantations and developments and all that. Yeah. And as you, if you're a family, you know, you have three sons, you have to divide a piece of land with three sons. And that, and if you multiply that effect through the generations, each son or each grandson is going to have less and less likelihood of surviving. So, you know, poverty, poverty um, is still an issue up to that point. Like, okay. is there this, because it, it, as well in, I don't want to keep throwing it back to Thailand, but there is kind of this <laughs> expansionist drive from the kind of what we call the Thai imperial core. So mm. the, the main urban populations um, going out into more remote areas of the country to, you know, essentially colonize it or to make it productive at the very least. And, you know, there's a huge amount of land in Malaysia, which is quite you know, untouched, right? Um, so, for example, the island of Borneo and stuff like that. Um, w- was there, like, a drive to go and colonize these areas? And, and also, we should probably mention the indigenous populations to these areas as well, no? Yeah, uh, there, there, well, there was a sizable indigenous population. Um, they've largely been displaced uh, along, along with the Malay peasantry, but, you know, post-independence... Um, their situation would be on a steady decline anyway, because in a sense, you know, British the British probably encroached on them. The new Malaysian government yeah. probably encroached on them. So I'll get back to a bit about the indigenous people later on. But generally, sure. the the situation was stagnant, if not deteriorating, for the the, the peasantry overall. Um, and so this largely continued at the low hum. Um, mm. This period was considered a lazy fair kind of period because again. Uh, you know, whatever whatever companies and whatever interests that were already set up by the British remained there. And what's interesting is that how it's tied up with, you know, the Chinese capitalist interests. So, you know, the Chinese capitalist interests, um, not that heavy into manufacturing, very, mi- very sort of low tech, very small scale uh, commodity production, and generally, you know, doing the trade kind of stuff as well. So they they had a bit of a stick in the 
British colonial project because their you know value chains were tied up with the British and all that. So they, the Chinese capitalist class, were completely happy. The people who were not happy during post independence were the emergent Malay capitalist class. Um, these were you know generally a combination of um, people who were lucky enough to get educated, the sons of teachers, the feudal class. These were the emergent Malay capitalist class, and with the economy, aspiring bourgeoisie. Correct. Um, so with yeah. the economy as it was, there was nowhere for them to go. You know, a lot of these sectors were kind of locked off. They had um, they had economic congresses to try and figure out like what you know what can we do about that, and so the second prime minister was very was very caught up with a lot of this uh, a lot of this economic empowerment kind of language. Uh, the second prime minister, uh, Tun Abdul Raza, himself was a Fabian socialist, someone who, you know, when in the UK, right, yeah, yeah, was uh, part of the Fabian society. Um, I was trying to look up if he had any connection to Nehru or had, had ever met Nehru, but I couldn't find it. But you know, it 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 could it could see a bit of a parallel. Yeah, there was a real breed of. Uh post post independence leaders at this time from colonized countries like Nehru, obviously Sukarno, um, particularly in this region. So like of course Malaysia had one of these leaders for a little bit. And they were all like these kind of kind of socialist, kinda of not and, and this this kind of uh, I mean this was like the classic third worldism, right? Not not in the Maoist sense. Yeah. Um, and these leaders are all completely dead and so is their, you know, relevance to modern times, frankly, as well. <laughs> Well, but these guys would be error defining. So you know, um, just yeah, just for, for a bit for the time, just for a bit of narrative. Yeah. This this story culminates in the uh, 1969 May 13 riots, something that's continually touched on right. in Malaysian history. Um, there have been uh, stories and allegations that this was a complete, you know, a completely planned up by the uh, second prime minister and you know the, this emergent. Uh, Malay capitalist class so that it would create you know that moment of emergency so the, the pretext for it was the huge losses of the alliance in the 69 elections there were rumours of a riot the riot took place I think the death toll was in the hundreds the country was and this was this was urban Chinese mostly right correct this happened yeah at least from the stories I've heard mostly in the urban areas because it was an inter-ethnic conflict between uh, the Chinese and the Malays and this yeah. was perpetuated by the idea that the Chinese controlled the economy. Um, and so the targets became Chinese, when in reality, the statistics revealed that the Chinese probably controlled somewhere between 20 to 30% of capital or equity ownership, and the British controlled like 40 to 50%. So, you know, this was completely a perception thing. So post, post, the, post the emergency that was declared, and, you know, the... The reordering of society, the the three main part, the three main parties that made up the alliance became a bigger coalition. Started swallowing up some of these left wing groups also to try and build right. like a sort of big tent. And so that that kind of what you call that social arrangement started carrying on from seventy one. And again, one of the you know really Malaysia defining moments was the new economic policy. In in seventy one, they unveiled the new economic policy that would, you know, radically try to alter class structures in Malaysia under the pretext of, you know, ethnic redistribution, you know, the language of, um, you know, we need all ra- we, we need to, we need all races to be uplifted. And I think one of the more explicit one was to try and disentangle race from occupation or race and, you know, these kind of sectors. Disentangle the idea that, you know, the, the Chinese lived in cities, Malays were peasantry and poor, Indians worked in plantations. So they, this new economic policy was meant to disentangle that. Um, but, you know, if you look at the end result, it was just to be able to build up a new class of capitalists. Um, of course, they did, you know, have all those, they, they did have what economists like to point to, you know, this Asian miracle. We had poverty drop from like uh, more than 50% down to like 4%, 3%, that kind of thing. Um, absolute poverty. So they would like to count a lot of these things. There was a massive uh, expansion of the public sector. You know, they 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 embarked on this before independent before the new economic policy. But you know, there was um, 
resettlement schemes where you know they would go into plantations and this had a more racial emphasis post the NEP. So these plantations that they were being set up were already being the new ones were already being set up by Malays for Malays, um, but there was an increasing uh, effort to push the Indian, you know, the Indian proletariat or the Indian peasantry out of these plantation sectors, and so that got increasingly replaced with uh, Malay uh, plantation workers or quote unquote co-owners or settlers. It, it's a very it's a very ambiguous kind of process. They went about partial land reform. You know, they they it's the state held the land in trust for this particular ethnic group. And what what is the role of is this the kind of time that Islam starts rising again? Am I right? Or like Islamic sentiment in, in a Malay nationalist sense? I would say not. I would say you know people no. in the popular imagination the the Islamic sentiment doesn't really rise until later. You know when okay. Um, when Mahathir takes over, and um, there have been some sort of theor- theorizations about why, because obviously Islam was around, but there wasn't there wasn't institutions built for Islam until the Mahathir era. You know, this is where this is probably the period where the labor independence was completely wiped out um, because right. they needed foreign capital to arrive to to build up the. To build out the Malaysian economy, so those two prime ministers, it was export-oriented industrialization, this massive expansion of the public sector, um, and so this Malay capitalist class, you know, basically got what they wanted. Um, the Chinese capitalist class, to some extent, was not was sidelined, but not fully sidelined. This is the period where this is the period all the way up to today, where the emergence of the Malay middle class and all of that begins to take take shape, you know. Um, there would be things like racial quotas for universities to try and get more Malay students. Um, there would be the things that Chinese people like to point to, you know, like, uh, you know, Malays get a discount on housing. Uh, they get preferential treatment um, in certain things. Um, they also have a condition where, you know, if you're a foreign company, no, even if you're a local company, I think they may have relaxed this a bit, but in the past, it was 30% of your board had to be Malay. So that this was a way for them to quickly entrench Malay ownership and equity within the society. Um, so they probably got up to 20%, but it wasn't the number that they wanted. So they, they, they would have to keep pushing the years after that. So that's, this is just the rough story of the, the second and third prime minister. The exciting part is the fourth prime minister, Mahathir. <laughs> I was just going to say before we get to that that like it is remarkable that given these really intense antagonisms that there hasn't been more violence that there hasn't been you know more hostility between these groups. The theory, I mean if you were to try and guess why it was probably because the pie was growing pretty fast. Um the right. groups that were left behind were obviously um the indigenous people because they were not integrated into mainstream society. Uh, the uh, Indian peasantry, because they were pushed out of the estates. And so they've, um, you can go and watch an Al Jazeera documentary on this. Um, they've become sort of, um, they've, they've become sort of an underclass or lumpen proletariat sort of, um, because right now, you know, the proletariat in Malaysia aren't Malaysian. You know, it's all migrant labor. These are the people who occupy the factories and all of that. So Indians really don't have anywhere to go after being pushed out of those estates. They weren't supported in the way Malays were and all that. The Chinese, it sounds really essential to say, but like, um, it sounds really essentialist to say, but they had, we had our own set of institutions which the Chinese elite supported so that, you know, social mobility remained high, you know. Chinese tycoons would regularly give you money if you scored straight A's and, you know, exams and there would be this guilds that were tied to names and all that so there's a very orientalist kind of explanation to why you know the chinese were all right they didn't they didn't have to resort to violence because you know they weren't they weren't left behind they they are probably the ones that have the most like rag to riches kind of stories in malaysia you see that in the news fairly regularly and so this is this is sort of an anecdotal kind of explanation of why there was no violence 
when we went to the labor museum we saw like uh, about the chinese we like this the secret societies and that kind of thing like mm. uh, how, how how was that linked in in in, 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 in if at all i like, did did were there like chinese secret societies in malaysia or uh, yeah. You, yeah 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 uh, so how did that play into their their ability to sort of you know not bring the you know like sort of maintain a, a sense of social mobility uh it's not linked to those secrets i mean it's not linked to those uh, secret societies but how did, as far as well, i no, know what, what, the, what did the secret societies do because I, I, I just like to hear <laughs> about secret societies <laughs> i think it was similar to the story back in mainland china secret societies became mm. one of the cells or vehicles for the transmission of communist sort of communist and anarchist sort of uh. ideology it, it right. plays out a little similarly here uh, I don't know what happens to them after the communists co- kind of come to power. It's possible that you know these these networks kind of dissolve. Um, what remains are these elite institutions, you know, the the guilds. So if I have a certain surname, sadly I'm not one of the the ones that are more prestigious. <laughs> but if I had a certain surname, I could walk up into the guild and like, you know, uh, could I have a scholarship or could you help my family? Out? You know, there, right. there was there was a certain yeah. amount of access to that. Um, but even without that, you know, Chinese elites are the ones setting up these pr- these Chinese schools that have high quality of education that Malays are trying to get into. So there is an elite support structure um, that seems similar to the sort of like the Jewish story in America, you know, where the, the elites don't really forget about the, the rest of the community. There is a kind of a kinship network that continues to build and they build institutions it's not a it's not a handoff they build a school or you know usually it's more than just a charity so that's that's kind of my explanation of why the chinese haven't taken up arms <laughs> well uh chula longhorn said chinese are the jews of asia well, so it wasn't, there you chula, go. it wasn't chula longhorn it was oh, was uh, it not chula oh you're right it's always misattributed to him who, who it was one of them Maybe, yeah, it was yeah. rama six for jewel Rama six. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> so when Mahathir kicks in, it's he tries to emulate the Korean model, um, and this is where I can get into some. Yeah, I think I explain how how this kind of works in the global scheme. But basically, he goes about doing heavy industrialization. We go into all sorts of strange yeah. things like chemicals, steel. Famously, we'll try to make a car, and uh, that only partially works out for us. Um, you know, what else? Cement factories. The Malaymobile. <laughs> they didn't call it that. They called it Proton instead. Um, I oh, don't know if that was cool. the best move. Um, but yeah, we're stuck with it. So this was this was actively trying to fill that industrialization base similar to Korea, uh, where you know they believed that they needed to move up the technological chain, and so they went on to heavy industrialization, tried to emulate them, um, but with a twist. They, he wanted, you know, the Malay agenda to be moved, you know, so Malays would helm all these big industries, Malays would be the one to um, to staff a large number of them. Um, of course, there was participation from other races, but the big project was to create the this ch- Malay entrepreneur class or the capitalist class, because what was interesting up to that point is that, you know, in spite of the aspirations of this Malay capitalist class, they couldn't they, they couldn't take off on their own. They constantly needed the government to hold their hand through all of it. And so that, that led to a lot of state expenditure, a lot of you know, allegations of corruption, and all these heavy industries lost money. I think they closed down the steel plant, they closed down the chemical. I mean, the chemicals, I think, might, might have sold it off, but it's all kind of all gone. Um, I have uh, one family friend who's Malay lived in England for a long time and he's a you know we say like self-hating Jew he's like a self-hating Malay and he's like oh us Malays we're lazy we can't do shit (laughs) you know we need people to help us is that this is kind of like a joke stereotype right yeah and and people feel insecure people feel the need to tell you like I earned my scholarship you know rather than the government handing it to me because of this legacy of you know um, the government having so heavily intervened to to create this capitalist class, to create its own middle class, you know. Um, and the middle class would largely be built through the fact that Malays were heavily absorbed into the civil service. Because if you go into the civil service, you know, you get a stable salary, yeah. um, you have a nine to five job, you know, it should it will guarantee that your kids will at least be at that level, if not higher. 
So they had to engineer their, their middle classes. So, you know, all of this is in the name of producing the Malay capitalist class. And he continues to go about this primarily with foreign direct investment. So this ties up to this, this Mahathir era sort of culminates in the Asian financial crisis where we were recording, you know, right. 8 to 10% growth primarily from FDI. You know, Thailand has a similar story where hot money just suddenly mm-hmm. flows in really fast for that 10 to 15 years. And, you know, we think we're hot shit, you know, we think, you know, we've made it. Yeah. Uh, we, we think we've found a model that will work forever. Um, a lot of these industries were over levered. And, you know, they went, they, a lot of them went bust uh, during the crisis. And the, the capitalist class had to recalibrate. Um, but ultimately, they, they failed to consolidate the class. Because even the Malay capitalist class is just, you know, just doing deals with these politically connected non-Malay capitalists. But, you know, they, they clearly have different interests, you know. And politically, they don't necessarily see eye to tie all the time. Um, and... This is consolidated during the Mahathir era, and it sort of leads up to today. So I just wanted to say, sorry, on um, that that era you're talking about, the Mahathir era, like maybe later on before the crash, like this was maybe like the most delusional era of man. You know, it's like <laughs> the economy is expanding 10% every single year. Yeah, it's, before uh, the Great Depression the in of, 1929, there was the same. Yeah. yeah, but it's like also all coupled with that is end of history, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. the fall of the Soviet <laughs> Union yeah. and what have you. And uh, and then, yeah, everything just comes brutally crashing. We should do an episode on the Tom Young Goon crash. We actually. should, I think. Actually, maybe excellent. in our tax in episode, we'll go into yeah, that, surely. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you call it Tom Young Goon crash as well in Malaysia? Uh, no, it's called the Asian financial crisis. 97 uh, to 98. Boring, it's called the boring. Nazi panache. At least blame it on the Thai. <laughs> At least just say it, the, the fucking Thai crisis. Cause, I, mean, yeah. I mean, here, because of anti-Semitism, I think we blame it on Soros. I think that's... <laughs> oh, nice. I think so. Because he's a currency manipulator. No way. It's true. That is um, insane. That's that's actually a perfect segue because I did want to talk about the rise of George Islamic Soros, Malay oh. nationalism, <laughs> <laughs> funder of this podcast, George Soros. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so how 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 does because like there there has been this rise of uh, nationalist Islamic sentiment, right? Uh, it, I would I would imagine it would have started around this era. It started during the Mahathir era. Later into it, I think it was the mid yeah. to late nineties. Arguably, is that is that was that at all connected to other currents in the Islamic world? No, I think it was largely a response to the a destabilization of the state. I'm trying to pick the date exactly because it could coincide with the um, the, the Asian financial crisis, uh, but maybe not. Yeah, that's but kind of what I was imagining. How how is largely explained why he did why that was necessary was because they were largely competing with the Islamist party here um, and they needed to and there was a point of sort of I wouldn't call it a social crisis but you know they needed to consolidate their position and so Mahathir was the one responsible for setting up um, things like the department of Islam within the prime minister's department that would go on to you know do all sorts of really stupid shit like you know they would uh, on Valentine's Day, go out to parks and try and actually like yeah. harass or arrest people. I mean, Malay people, you know. Um, and then yeah. there would be raids on like hotel rooms uh, to check that, you know, only married couples were staying over, you know, it wasn't uh, uh, unmarried couples and all that shit. So there's a lot that of that. still happens now in Thailand on Valentine's Day, by the way. But who buys? <laughs> um, by the police. To make sure that underage couples aren't staying in uh, hotel rooms on Valentine's Day together. Seriously, yeah. Under the pretext they posted on Dinding about it. Of Vir- virtue, what do what do they call it? Virtue. I don't fucking know. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, no. In the constitution, in the constitution, um, good values and morals, or something like that. Yeah. There we go. Good morals. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you need a nice, vague constitution so you can do whatever the fuck you want. Um, oh, Lord. Yeah. 
Okay. So that sucks. I mean, it's just interesting because for me, like just seeing like this uh, rise of Islamic nationalism, it, it, it yeah, it's interesting you say it's not connected to the rest of the world because or the rest of the Islamic world because I, I there there were, it did happen in other places at around the same time. So for example, Turkey, uh, Indonesia certainly, um, Egypt to a degree as well. Um, yeah, I maybe this was just like a, you know the 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 end of history era kind of reshaping of the social socio political structures in some of these countries maybe that's what led to it um, happening at the same time. It is it, it is a lot of these kind of games they are playing to consolidate their base to sort of divert tension to avert crises. Um, yeah, I mean just on one MDB, I you said you know we get to the fun stuff. I did find it to be one of the most excruciatingly boring stories of all time, <laughs> even though, you know, it's maybe the biggest money laundering scheme in world history. Um, but it is excruciatingly boring until you realize one thing, which is, and this is this is my take. This is my big 1MDB oh, take, no. right? In my opinion, 1MDB <laughs> was basically just a plan for a Malay billionaire to hang out and be buddies with Leonardo DiCaprio. That's essentially what it was, right? <laughs> I think you mean the, a Malaysian? Because that, that, that guy was Chinese, right? Jolo, you're referring to that guy? No, Jolo. Wait, was he Chinese or was... Uh, he's Chinese. Is he not Malay? With a, with a name yeah, Chinese, like, sorry, with a Chinese name like Malay. Jolo. Yeah, <laughs> Chinese Malay. My apologies. Anyway, YMDB was basically just an attempt to be buddies with Leonardo DiCaprio and it ended up being the biggest money laundering I, scheme of all time. And, and the Thai government helped. That's right. And the Thai government oh, helped. Thai government. So, do you know what I'm talking about? No, I, I've, I've seen the pictures at like the Wolf of Wall Street yeah. like premiere or something like that. Or so, it, it yeah, YMDB funded Wolf of Wall Street yep. and it basically was... So it was like Joe Lowe is the kind of architect behind this massive money laundering scheme, right? Which was the Malaysia Development Bank which was supposed to invest in... Uh, infrastructure and business and you know shit like that and uh, Mr. Joe Lowe and uh, Najib Razak uh, is that right? Yeah Najib Razak yeah and um, there was one other guy uh, Najib's uh, son-in-law or some shit Reza yeah was kind of the three main players involved but it seems it was really just uh, Joe Lowe wanting to like give Leonardo DiCaprio whatever he wanted <laughs> like he bought like art for him he bought art from him he like yeah. bought a house like in his neighborhood he funded his movies like he <laughs> he flew him to like fancy hotels so he could hang out with him you know i mean I, it kind of rocks like it's kind of cool i think he honest, even yeah. bought i think he even bought kim kardashian a car or something some shit like yeah that. there's there's I, just loads of crap about i know about I, miranda I, I, oh yeah no there was oh. also dude, there was there's just <laughs> He's just he's just in there with 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 the crowd. He's just with the he's with the cool kids. Um, but Jolo's mm. yeah, Jolo. I think they describe Jolo as the LinkedIn billionaire. You know, he just does networking, <laughs> and then he gets he gets billions. And it really is like he really does have a knack for these like huge deals. And they said if he had if he had just slowed down, if he was just a little less ambitious, he might have never gotten caught because. The, this billion dollar deal was huge he's not but he's not in jail i mean he's just ch uh, uh chilling out in macau right so <laughs> supposedly an unknown province in china mm. well macau is an unknown province yeah <laughs> um so he rocks um so that's kind of i don't know what else is there really to say on 1mdb other than it nearly toppled the malay government and it looked like it did for a little bit and then it didn't um <laughs> which kind of shows the futility of the Malay political system, right, is you have the most, the the biggest money laundering scheme in history being exposed and pretty much nothing changes. I mean, it did for a little bit. And uh, after that, for a little it, bit. Just, it just did it, you know, um, fell back into place. It just threw shit into the air and then it all landed in the same place, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling to come up with like a Marxist sort of analysis of 1MDB. It's like, it's just so uh, I bizarre, think it's just random. it. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's the it's the pure ideology of the elite class. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't think that those words make any sense in that context, but it, it, it sort of it, it's like it, it's like how in how F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote The Great Gatsby to talk shit about the rich um, in in America at the time. It, it it's it's just the shenanigans, the mach the the extent to which um, 
you know, people will exploit the system for whatever. And, and, and obviously, we are joking about the DiCaprio take. <laughs> Actually, we're not. But no, we are. <laughs> it's not wrong, I think. Well, I think it just shows the, the, the real strength of when power gets really entrenched. You yeah, know what I mean? yeah, yeah. And, and people say like, oh, you know, power isn't so entrenched. Power is so entrenched in places like in the West, like in the UK is a classic example with our old aristocracy and mm, shit like that. Mm. But power can get entrenched very quickly. Like yeah. in Malaysia, this, this coalition hasn't even been around for that long and still they're doing whatever the fuck they want, pretty much. So... Yeah, I mean, they're, they're used quick. to the levers of power. There are a couple new players, but, you know, generally the guys... Yeah. All, all the guys are from Amno. you know? The, the, the guy who's from Mahathir's party after he left it, they're all from Amno. They're all Malay Nationalist Party. So, you know, mm. it's... But back to your point about, you know, power being entrenched. I don't know if that would be my takeaway. I'm like, the takeaway is probably no. that elites are pretty stupid. Um, because you know Jolo beat all of them. That's that's the real yeah. conclusion, I think. <laughs> yeah. But he, did he? You know what I mean? Like it all worked out for pretty much everybody in the end. Only one guy really loses out on this, and his punishment is to just chill in a giant casino in Mercal for the rest of his life. So, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there weren't really any. That not many heads rolled. Let's put it that way. Um, no heads have rolled. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Um, the, exactly. The one of these BBC CEO hasn't even gone to jail or anything for covering it up. So yeah, yeah it's all still up in the air. Goddamn corner and just just right. goes. Ooh, you need to start another insurgency. Inspector <laughs> Yeah. I would ask him where I get the funds for the guns. So. Uh, he, um, he so you got to do some to deal with the Brits. You got to grow some drugs or something. Uh, that's probably oh yeah, yeah. Oh, there's uh, yeah, there's <laughs> two options right one you've got to grow some some heroin or two you've got to do an alliance with a brit with the brits or the americans at some point and then turn the guns against <laughs> yeah, them. yeah 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 that, that sounds about right which how asian insurgencies got going yeah. in the past so i mean didn't end well for the Kurds, so i'm not inclined to the Americans. <laughs> hey it's not over it's not, not over. over. It's, it's not, not over, over but until Americans are gone. It's not over <laughs> until the fat lady sings, and the fat lady in this case is Abdullah Ocalan, and he's he's not yes. singing. He's busy writing. He's writing in prison. I hope. I'm hoping he. I'm anyway. hoping he makes it. <laughs> anyway, I think uh, this is probably definitely a bumper episode, mm. so uh, we'll have to call it a day. And uh, do you want to plug Imagine Malaysia? And you have some other projects, right? Um, I'm part of a history research organization called Imagine Malaysia. The website is uh, imagine.my, imagined with a D for imagined communities by ben uh, ben Benedict Anderson. Um, the other thing I'm a part of that I write regularly for is Malaysia Muda. Um, it's Malaysia Muda, M-U-D-A. You can just Google that, something should come up. Um, and that's it from me. Um, yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, all right, folks. So, my have a good one. Yeah, you too. And um, cheers, mate. Uh, and we'll see you next week. All right. Bye bye.